thinking about all the things that you have been doing since you've been in this position as commissioner of MDOC, what is something you're most proud of? I'm probably most proud that we finished our first church at, at uh, MCIW, which is the 0720 for the women. And it two more is under construction, one at Parchment and one at SMCI, two more is on deck. I appreciate Mississippi citizens for helping pay for them because we didn't use tax dollars. And I appreciate the Mississippi Prison Chapel Foundation for raising the funds because moral rehabilitation is the only true rehabilitation that there is. And so to change criminals, we need to work on morals. And that's what we're doing, really strong, hot and heavy, and it's working. Now, you did mention parchment. A lot of people are concerned about the conditions there. There have been documentaries talking about it. What can you tell me about what's going on there now? Parchment is totally changed, and it's a little, it won't be long until the governor's going, when it gets cooler, he's going to take y'all all to parchment, and he's going to show you. We spent $19 million on parchment of our money that we set aside. It ran a little bit of deficit from doing it, though, but parchment had been all rebuilt where it was all damaged and so forth. The showers are new and good. And the other good news is all the buildings at parchment are air conditioned except unit 29 and 17, which is a death row that we will open up again, the old death row. And so, but the others, 26, 27, 25, 30, are all air conditioned. And that's wonderful. 29 is coming, but not quite yet. It'll be here next year. But the same for air conditioned is, the uh, women, the 0720, it'll be, it, the bid is already done, it's approved, it'll be air conditioned, won't help this year, but it will for next summer, it's really good. Also one of the part, one of the units at SMCI is already bid, has been, been approved, and it'll be air conditioned. The others didn't get approved because the bid were too high, we've got to go back and get more money. But anyway, we're going to have it air conditioned before it's over, all of MDOC, maybe the next two, three years, everybody. So that's gonna help a lot. So Unit 29 has historically had a lot of issues and you said there will be changes. It, it, it's been totally repaired. When you go in Unit 29, it's gonna look like new because it's new showers, new, new toilets, new everything in there. It's all fixed because we have to comply with the Justice Department, they're coming. And so in doing that, then we really went on and fixed everything so we're not out of compliance and therefore we're trying to avoid any kind of consent decree which would cost a citizen of Mississippi a lot of money so we can save a lot of money by spending a little money now and that's what the governor wanted to do and the lieutenant governor was fix it and let's get it done and let's avoid a consent decree at all costs and so that's what our job is to do and we've done that so any updates to any other facilities right now that you can tell me about well right now we're we're revamping ourselves because we had to we had a real intake problem because after covid the jails were full so then they flooded us with inmates to come in. So since the last 15 months, we've taken in 11,000 prisoners. Now we've released a lot, but our population has increased by about 2,000. So we had a we had a gain of 9,000, a gain of 2,000, because that's how much we went up. We've been letting people go. Now to do that, we worked with Chairman Belk of the Pro Board to do presumptive parole. This is something you probably hadn't heard of. But what it is, people who are nonviolent don't have any RVRs just come in and they have a parole date within a year from now, then they can go into presumptive parole, which means we do their case, where they have to have a GED, they have to do certain things. But if they do all these things and the parole board approves it, and then when their parole date comes, they just get out. We presume you're gonna get out. When you get your parole date, you don't even have to see the board again, but they're looking at your case file and all. Now, here's the thing. We're gonna flood probation and parole with people because this just started. We just started this the, the 1st of September. So in three and four and five and six months, we'll be letting a lot more people go that don't see the parole board just get out. That means our parole officers have got to really buckle down and catch up so we don't let them recidivate and we have to have skills and trade. And that's part of the presumptive parole. They have to be prepared for a job. And then that parole agent have to find them a job and MDOC work does that. But we're short probation and parole officers so this is a good time to apply to us for a parole job. We have jobs, and if you like to be kind of macho and carry a gun and so forth, then this is a good thing for you to come apply to be a parole officer. And we can fix you up. We need to help. And you'll get a car and get all this kind of stuff so you can ride around and be cool. <laughs> so, 
So come and apply to be a parole officer with us real quick. Also correctional officers. But we have increased our, pro our pro correctional officers significantly. So we're doing well with that too. So now I, I do want to transition kind of back toward the facilities. So some people have been saying they're having difficulty getting to their relatives or meeting them or being able to visit. Do you know anything about that? Now we do have video visiting on the tablet where you can video visit and that way mom don't have to drive all the way here and don't have to worry about the gas. Save money, you get 15 minutes, you see it's real cheap, but just a few dollars to do it, four or five dollars to pay for it. And then we, our visiting rooms are open and flowing good and we have our inmate clubs and organizations that are working there and we have we have the blind and have vending machines in our in our visiting room, but a lot of food to eat from the organ clubs and organizations we have. We form clubs so that we replace gangs with clubs because human beings want to belong to a group. So we create groups you can belong to so you don't have to be in a gang and we kill off the gangs, send their leaders to other states. I just did that to one here we caught this morning. We went and got him out of prison, got him out of bed this morning, got him and his cell phone and his knife and he's on his way to, California, to Colorado. But he won't be able to see the mountains because he's going to be in a big old prison, locked down, so that's cool. But he needs to quit starting and doing that stuff in our prison. So we're watching that. We cut our gang population significantly, and uh, that's good. And we hope to actually get rid of them by creating other things for you to belong to. You know, church is good because we have our own inmate preachers because we have our own seminary. We have a women's seminary, you know. We, may, we have women preachers with four-year degrees, just like you have from your college. And we have 100 inmates that are in a seminary at Parchment. And so they'll have a four-year degree from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Then they become preachers, and they preach to all our different inmates in the prison. And that's why we're building churches. So then they have a church to go in and bring their congregation. They'll have the church for two and a half hours. Then the next denomination will have it, and the next, and the next, and the next. And so we have a lot of church and really utilize our chapels now. We don't depend on chaplains to preach. We have inmate preachers. We create our own. But that's, that's groups, and so therefore there's no place for the gang. Boom, out it goes. You see this every single day. So what do you think the solutions are to stopping the crime crisis that we have? Well, I know how to stop the crime in the prison because we have, because you don't read about us being that violent anymore, and you haven't seen any murders here in a while. But what we do is if you get caught in our prison with a killing weapon, you go to Walnut Grove and you don't come back. And so what you have is you have to have discipline. Human beings must have discipline. And uh, when you catch these guys with these guns on the street, you need to realize that, that one or two things, they either really mean or they're cowards and afraid. And so either way, they don't need to be on the street. But when you slap their hand and let them go, then here you go and you have more and more violence. You had to have consequences for bad behavior. If you don't, you don't correct bad behavior. And I think sometimes we're too light on crime in some cases when you have guns. You need to get the guns off the street, but you get the guns off the street but get the people off the street that's carrying the guns. And when they catch them, they need to not just slap their hand, they need to do something with them incarcerate them or something until they get a little older, especially these young kids. But do you think incarceration really is the way to go? Is there another way that we can rehab a situation? I tell you, there is other ways, but, but the one thing, you can't, you're not, you can't gamble. And so what we do in prison is, when you get caught with a kid and weapon, I have to protect the good. And since you're prone to have to want a knife, I need to lock you up so I can let the others roam free and protect them by keeping you away from them. If I don't lock you up with a knife, then I'm putting all these others that are trying to do good at risk of you because many times you're a coward. You think one of them is going to hurt you, so you stick him in the night while he's asleep or in the back. Either way, he's dead because I let you get over here with him. So this one needs to be incarcerated. So when we say we incarcerate too many, we incarcerate the wrong ones because the ones that are prone to hurt you, you better get them off the street to keep the rest of the folks on the street safe. Because you see what happens when you don't get them off the street, because they're not off the street, they wouldn't be killing one another. In the prison, you're not out there killing. So I'm having less violence than you having maybe on the street, because I got my predators locked up. You have your predators roaming. So you got, you got to rethink what you're doing. Marijuana, because it is uh, become illegal. What, what can you tell us about your thoughts on if people should be let go? now that the situation has changed. 
I think that we that the crime and the incarceration is a continuous process because 15 years ago marijuana was terrible you couldn't have it it was a bad thing today you sell it the medical does it and so forth so therefore that's the time to lighten up and relook at what you do because the culture in America and so forth is changing and so we need to move our incarceration our laws along with the with the public as long as we don't get way out there and go so far so anyway I wouldn't we're doing it right because now we don't have as harsh of crimes for for that for marijuana because it's legal but the other drugs and we look at marijuana as a gateway drug we have to watch for that because who what when and where so it's a complicated thing to work out but we have some smart legislators I have faith in them and I think they'll make the right decisions when it comes to drugs what can you tell me about the intake process so far well, when, uh, when COVID was over, the sheriffs were full of inmates and much more than we thought. And so we had a big influx. We were too slow taking them in. We would never get it done. So we had to privatize it because we couldn't get our people speeded up fast enough. And so in the last 14 months, we've taken in about 11,000 prisoners from the, from the county jails. And so uh, that is big. But in doing that, we cut the population in the county jail, so therefore we don't have to pay the county to house our inmates as much. And we've saved about half a million dollars doing that for MDOC. That means they lost that much going into the counties because we got more efficient with bringing people in. But that's what we have to do. The only thing permanent is change. We have to keep changing and getting faster in MDOC and making it a stellar organization that's really efficient to save money and dollars. That's why we work to restore our prisons and not hire contractors. All this work I talked about doing, we did ourselves. We didn't hire contractors to come in and fix anything because we have the inmates that learned all those skills and they can do it themselves, which we haven't done in Mississippi before. But we're saving buku dollars by just doing the repairs at Unit 29 and rebuilding those showers and rebuilding the thing with inmates themselves doing it and they love to work because they're busy. But now we pay an inmate, so that's a good thing too. <clears throat> we pay an in with money we we make from tobacco sales which is about 1.2 million a year profit so we spent about at this point about four hundred thousand dollars paying inmates from a nickel from 10 cents to 50 cents an hour so that they work they get paid so then they can go have money to buy cookies and cakes and a few things they don't could normally have less burden on their families as well so that's a good thing so it's more economy, so we're teaching entrepreneurship to inmates when we have clubs and organizations where that they're now making hamburgers and so forth at visiting and to sell each other and pizza. And so they get to eat different kind of food, but they're paying for it, but we're giving them money to pay for it, but they're earning the money. So that's a good thing. So now the last question, just to wrap this up, is what does MDOC need and what are you looking forward to in this upcoming two years? Not a lot. We need a, we need a budget that, that will let us continue to finish repairing what hasn't been done in the past. So when you don't budget for years and then all of a sudden we come along, we got to fix all what hasn't been maintained, then we need more money. And so we're getting enough, and the governor sees that in the legislature, and, and, and they're helping us and giving us more money. <coughs> but sometimes, you know, maybe not quite enough, but then we also need to be able to hire probation parole officers. We need to pay more. We're paying a highway, we're paying a highway patrol more. We're paying the game more than all. I hope they're moving up, too. But we need to be sure that we're moving our law enforcement, which parole officers carry guns. They're, 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 they're real officers with that, then they need to move with the rest of the law enforcement people, and I'm afraid they're not. And so we need to help them move on up because we run into too many vacancies, especially with presumptive parole. So I've got to pay them more, and so it's just got to happen. And that's my biggest glitch right now is paying them, but also hiring correctional officers, but having a safe environment so people will come work for us, and we're a lot safer than we were. Cool deal. We're doing one, another good program we're doing is with the Mississippi Highway Patrol, whether we're working with them with our horse patrol and theirs to do search and rescue. And so if someone's lost in the woods or somebody, what have you, then we can uh, work together to find them as well as if someone runs away from prison. Because now we have some good bloodhounds, but we're working with horse patrol to do that. And so that's important to us. And then we also work with wildlife and fisheries to build duck blocks, duck, the little duck nests for wood ducks and so forth, so they can put those out, and that's good for the 
you know, for the wildlife and so forth. So we partner with other agencies, just like we're going to be working with five inmates that's going to be working with MDOT to pick up the trash on the streets here in Hines County and on the interstates. And so they're going to come out of Madison work release to uh, to see to uh, work work doing that. They're going to be paid as well to, to pick up the trash. So that's a good thing. As we work with other agencies and utilize inmates to do civic things back to the community, because the the main thing that changes prisoners is to learn to, to not be a taker, but to be a giver. And that's why you have the moral program and so forth. So here they're giving back. And so that's a good thing, rather than being a tiger all the time. So anyway, good things happening with with us partnering with other agencies and so forth. 